Welcome everyone to the Parrot Club. Today on May 16th, we have Dr. Graham Martin talking to us from the UK. And Dr. Martin is Emeritus Professor of Avian Sensory Science at the University of Birmingham, where he established the Center for Ornithology and set up the first master's program in ornithology in the UK. He's an ornithologist with an international reputation built upon his research into the sensory world of birds. In recent years, he's used his expertise to focus on problems concerned with the functions of vision, especially binocular vision and foraging behavior, and in understanding why some bird species are particularly vulnerable to collisions with human artifacts, such as wind turbines, power lines, and fishing nets. He's the author of the recently released book, Bird Senses, How and What Birds See, Hear, Smell, Taste, and Feel, available at Amazon and other booksellers. Actually, I have the book. I was planning to hold that up, so I'll, I'll do that afterwards. So without further ado, Dr. Martin. Okay, so I need to share my screen now, do I? Okay, let's try. Right. All right, okay. Are we, are we sharing all right? Can you confirm, Amy, that that's okay? You've got that, have you? Great, okay. Right, okay, let me go. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it, it's, it's good fun to be able to talk about these things. It's something that, you know, I've spent my whole career worrying about what birds can see and hear and such like, and thinking about the implications of it. So it's very nice when another group of people suddenly pop up and say they're interested in something uh, along those lines as well. So I'm going to try and give you an overview of something that we know about parrot, mainly parrot vision, but we'll have to stray into uh, a couple of other senses as well, as we'll see. Um, one of the problems with some, you know, well, people ask me to talk about a particular group of birds or particular species is, that, of course, we know very little about any in, in, in any great detail. So some of what I have to say is, is going to be generalizing from just a few studies, a few examples, uh, and they might not apply to all parrot species, and I'm pretty sure they won't. But there's some very interesting little things I think that I can, can tell you about. Um, well, I'll, I'll just start off with some very basics, actually, um, about um, what birds, hang on, I've got to click through. Um, about bird vision uh, and, and just get over a couple of, of, of basic points. I mean, th this slide here is one that I often use when I'm starting a talk about anything, any group of birds. Um, it's a very interesting group of birds because these are all bird species on which I have worked and published some aspect about their vision or other senses, but principally vision. Um, and the, the interesting thing is that this slide, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a resume of some of the species which I could tell you about and describe in detail. But equally, if you look at this slide, uh, what you see is a fantastic diversity of birds. And one of the things that jumps out at you is a fantastic diversity of beaks and, you know, the bill shapes and sizes of all these birds are very, very different. Uh, and we're quite used to the idea that all these bills have evolved for particular functions uh, and that we can explain why, why there are these huge differences and what they're good for and what they're not good for and those sorts of things. And basically every bill sort of tells a story. Um, the interesting thing from my point of view uh, is that I've looked at the vision of these birds and every eye tells a story as well, a different story. So every bill can tell a story but equally every eye tells a story that there are differences, important differences between these species here in their vision, um, which is just as important and just as probably dramatic really, as are the differences in bill shapes and sizes, which we can already very readily comprehend. The problem with uh, looking at eyes and such like, it's, it's, it's a lot more difficult to find out what it is that a bird can see uh, and, and understand what perhaps the evolutionary processes are that led to it. But rest assured that every eye does tell a story and there are quite marked differences. We're going to concentrate here on parrots, obviously, uh, and there's all sorts of questions that we can ask about this. Um, one of the things that is worth just making a point about is that 
although eyes, bird eyes, and this is a section, basically a, a schematic section through a, uh, an owl's eye, um, but it's showing all the elements that you would find in any bird's eye, including your parrots. Um, they're all built around the same more or less simple design, but the trick about these simple designs is that within it, there's a lot of flexibility. There's the, the, the possibility of a lot of different flexibility. So you can split the eye between two main functional systems. You've got the optical system, which produces an image of the world outside the bird. And then you've got the image analysis system, which is the retina at the back of the eye. And the image is projected onto that. Uh, and there's a lot of scope for variation in parameters of the, the of the uh, image of the world that the bird receives, but also particularly the image analysis system, the retina can vary really very markedly from one species to another. Not only that, you've also always got two eyes in the head. And one of the things that I've been particularly interested in is what differences you can get in the visual field. The visual field is just simply a way of describing how much of the world the bird can see at any one moment. Uh, and this is a section through the head of a bird and you can see you've got two eyes, but they always diverge. They're never parallel like our eyes. They don't look straight forwards. Um, and you have these various parameters of, of the world about the bird. You have a binocular area in front, but you have a large monocular area to the sides, which just looked at by one eye. And of course you have a blind sector behind. And there's a huge amount of scope for variation in the optics of the eye, which gives a different field, but then how those two fields are put together, depending upon how the two eyes are placed actually in the skull. Um, so again, there's a huge chance to be have variation in here, uh, one species to another. And I just put these couple of diagrams in just to emphasize how different the visual world of a bird, the visual field of a bird uh, can be. And it's important to understand this because if you're trying to understand uh, you know, the behavior of a bird, you make an observation, you see it do something, um, you know, you could say, well, you know, it, it saw it before I did and that sort of thing. Um, well, the, a lot of that is going to be down to the visual field of the bird, how much of the world the bird can extract information from at any one moment. And on the left here, we've got an owl with eyes not actually facing forward, still slightly diverging with a reasonable binocular field, but nowhere near as big as our own. But on the right, you've got a duck uh, where the two eyes um, actually overlap um, in the front and behind and actually all above the head. Uh, and what this means is that in this duck here, this is a, a pink ear duck, but you find it in other duck species as well. They see everything around them all at once. You know, there's, you, you can't creep up on one of these ducks without it knowing you're coming uh, because it sees the whole of the hemisphere around its head and above its head at any one moment. And clearly to understand that sort of thing that's going on, where around the bird it can get information from, where it can detect things is really quite important. And we'll see that the parrots obviously have got really very comprehensive vision, not as comprehensive as the duck, uh, but a much bigger field of view uh, compared with something like ourselves and or something like an owl. Um, we're going to talk about vision, but vision is a, a tricky thing uh, because the, it, it's a multi um, aspect. There's many aspects to vision that we can measure as a way of characterizing it. And I'm going to try and run through a number of different things that we can say something about. First of all, that the important thing I suppose that people always jump to if you're going to compare one bird to another is spatial resolution, the acuity, how much detail can the bird actually see? Uh, and there are some estimates around, you'll see of, of that in, in parrots. So we can say something about how their spatial resolution compares with your own and with other birds. There's also the visible spectrum and color vision, how much of the, of the the spectrum of light that's around uh, co coming to them, can they actually see? Can they actually see down into the ultraviolet, for example? How good is their color vision? Um, there are also important things, variations across the retina. Um, that is how they actually process information that's coming to them. And we'll see some really quite interesting differences between parrot species uh, in how they gain information uh, in different parts of the world around them. They've got a different visual field, but they don't analyze that visual field in a uniform way. And we'll see some of that as well. 
Uh, the visual fields themselves are, vary from one species to another quite dramatically. Um, there's always seemed to be, and every species I've looked at, a sort of an interaction between vision and some other key sense for getting information. You know, there's a trade-off between vision and something else that's providing information. And in the case of parrots, it's vision and touch, definitely. There may be trade-offs with other senses as well. The vision and touch, and we'll look at that in some detail as well. And then there's this final thing, which is often referred to as speed of vision. And uh, I've been asked quite a few questions. I was asked particularly by Amy to, to, to address this. It's to do with um, how well the, the visual system is able to discern. Basically, it's used to discern flicker. You know, wh what is the difference between a, a, stable, a stable light source and a flickering light source? And how fast can that light source flicker? the animal to see it and that does have implications for can the bird actually see a, a flickering screen or not will it actually see it steady or will it see it flickering and that sort of thing so it, it, it's often referred to as speed of vision it's a funny sort of concept but we'll come we'll come down to it in a bit of detail uh, and look at it right first of all spatial resolution uh, and that's really asking the bird to tell us or we want to know what's the finest detail that it can see. So uh, this is just a little mock-up of the sorts of testing situations that it used, but, but it gives an idea as to what it is you might, um, what, what you're actually asking the bird and what you, you, you can find out about them. And this is the idea that you've got a, a parrot which is trained to sit on a perch. Um, this is at a fixed distance of 10 meters and it's trained to look at patterns and in this case, it's pairs of vertical and horizontal stripes. And you just train it by reinforcing it to go, say, to the horizontal stripes and it gets food. You move those patterns randomly left to right and it learns those very quickly and pretty reliably can you get 100% correct performance if you've got very wide stripes. Uh, and so the bird is actually making a choice between it can tell you whether it's vertical and horizontal. And then you can start uh, to play around with these strikes, with these patterns, and you can do all sorts of things with these, but you can make them finer and finer. Uh, and so you, you can test the bird and find, well, what's the limit? What's the finest detail that it can actually see? You get them going very well, and then you sort of give them testing probes of this is a very fine pattern. Uh, can you actually still see these stripes? And by doing that and making sure the birds are always observing from a particular fixed distance, um, you, you can actually get some really quite good definitive work and uh, details of what birds can see. And it's, it's a laborious sort of thing to do because it takes a lot of trials to actually get down to really be sure of the threshold of the bird's vision. But you, it's possible to do, and it's been done with a lot of different species. Uh, and so it's possible to come up with comparison between them. Um, you can use this same sort of technique of training the bird to go to one thing or another to probe its color vision, get it used to going to one color as opposed to another. And then you start to make those color colors closer together. And then you find the limit of which they can discriminate between colors, for example, things like that, that you can do with these fairly simple training techniques, simple but laborious training techniques. Well, these sorts of experiments have been done with parrots or <laughs> a couple of species of parrots, I'm going to say hundreds of species, uh, but they give us some idea. And you get a, get, you end up with a table like this, and I'll, I'll just take you through it. Um, um, what we, this is ranking birds with the, the parrots, the, uh, the only two species of, of parrots are, are the Badrigar and the Books parrot that have been looked at in this way. But I've po popped in here some other species so you can compare parrots to, to um, to uh, the, these other species. The top of the table is the wedge-tailed eagle, which is an Australian species. Uh, and that at the moment still has the highest acuity of any bird, in fact, of any vertebrate so far found. And you measure this in terms of minutes of arc, which is the, the finest stripe that you could actually see. You don't really need to be too worried about that. It's the comparison between them that's important. I've put humans down the bottom here uh, young humans are about half as good uh, as a, a, an eagle. Uh, 
Um, but for ourselves, people of rather mature years, our vision won't be anywhere near as good as that. And if you're wearing spectacles, it's corrected probably to about uh, a one minute of arc. Um, and you can see, so that, that we know we, we, we're considerably worse than an eagle, which isn't a surprise to you, um, I suppose. But it's the comparison between ourselves and the parrots and other species, which is probably most interesting. But what we can do is if we look at these, we, these figures can be simply divided one into another to give a ranking or a comparison between them. And basically, human acuity is about three times better than a parrot, even if you're wearing spectacles and you've got corrected vision. Uh, if you've got a young person, you know, a, a young person with keen eyes, uh, they will be considerably better than a parrot. Now, the parrot isn't fantastically worse than lots of other birds. In fact, they're in the middle range of a lot of bird species are in that range. And I put in there the rock dove and the Canada goose and well, and the great horned owl. They all come out not fantastically dissimilar to the parrot. So the parrots are, you know, they've got reasonable acuity, which is found in quite a lot of other birds, but it doesn't match our own acuity and it doesn't match the acuity of say the, 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 uh, the, the raptors uh, falcons or, or eagles and things like that. The, the other way of looking at this is not that this bird can see finer detail than you, but it, or, well, you can see finer detail than it because we are better than the parrot, but it actually also translates into the fact that for a given size object that you can just see, it would have to be three times nearer for the parrot to see it. So, or if you took a, a something that the parrot could just see, you could see that from three times further away. Now that's actually quite an in, interesting comparison because what it means is that, you know, you, it's not that it's going for fine detail, but it can pick up information about something that's of interest to it. Well, you can pick it up uh, long before your parrot can pick it up. The, the, the something is interesting, probably you can pick it up about three times further away than what the parrot can. So, uh, but, you know, we, we can't pick up things anywhere near at the distance that a, a, an eagle can. The eagle can, can outstrip us and can see something probably five times further away than ourselves. So the, the parrots that we've got, only the Budgerigar and the Birch parrots, are middling, middling birds in terms of their acuity, and they are worse than ourselves, even if we're sort of more mature years and, and such like. So they're not going to see such fine detail as we can. That's, that's what we see so far. Could be other parrots that are going to be tested where you find this, but these are the only ones that we know uh, at the moment. I move now on to the retina. Now the retina is a complicated thing and that this is a, a bit of a daunting diagram, but I'll take you through it because there's a lot of information in here of pertinence to uh, parrots and obviously to our, ourselves by way of comparison. And, the important thing is that we, we know that in the retina, we've got rods and cones. You're probably all familiar with the idea that we have rods, which give us our vision uh, at nighttime or at low light levels. And we have cones, which give us vision during the day at higher light levels. And it's the cones that give us color vision. Basically, it's the nighttime. We don't have any color vision because we've only got one type of rod and we, we don't have uh, we, you know you multiple types of, of, of receptors in the case of um, uh, that the cones, though, we as we have uh, they, the cones give us color vision, and we have three types of cones. Now, we've got millions of these, but they're only of three types, and they're spread right across the retina uh, in different abundances. Uh, we have three types of cones, and that gives us pretty good color vision. Our, our vision is pretty good. We can dis uh, discern between really a lot of colors. We can make very fine judgments, say within the rainbow. You could. Uh, look at things and say we have very subtle difference there. But when it comes to uh, a lot of birds, uh, they actually have four types of cones and parrots are one of those which have four types of cones. What that suggests to us is that uh, they've got finer color discrimination than we have, but it hasn't been done definitively in, in parrots, but they probably can see much finer differences in color than, than we can ourselves. Now, the, the the lower part of the diagram is showing us the visual spectrum, how much of the world, the spectrum of the world from the sunlight that's coming to us 
can can we see? Well, the, the human visible spectrum is shown there, but highlighted in the color, going from what's called 400 to 700 nanometers. Uh, that's a way of measuring the wavelength of light and gives you the spectrum. But the important thing about parrots and also other, other uh, all, all parrots and, and, and passerine birds is that they do have one cone receptor type, which is particularly sensitive down in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. And that actually pushes the width of the spectrum in which they can retrieve information from. So the spectrum of a parrot and also of, of, of other songbirds, for example, uh, extends much more into the UV than we can. So that's what, what that's suggesting, is that they've been able to make judgments about things and pick up information about things, which are reflective, say, in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, that we cannot see at all. So, uh, and there's a lot of fruits uh, and leaves and things like that, which reflect differently in the UV than in the visible part of the spectrum. And that suggests that, that parrots alongside other birds are able to deter, detect those differences, something which we are not aware of at all. So there is something going on there that we cannot, cannot actually discern. Now, the one in, interesting thing that came out when people started to find out about UV vision in, 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 in birds and particularly in the parrots as well, was to look at some of the plumage as well. And there's some really nice work has been done showing that there are plumage patterns which are reflective in the UV in some species of parrots, which to our eyes, we cannot see any difference. But a parrot will see a difference because they can see into the UV. So the parrot, a bird which looks, you know, particular range of colors to us, will look a different range of colors to a, to a parrot. And there'll be, there'll be hidden signals in there. Uh, for the, the parrots to discern from that. And so you can look at sex differences in these patterns of UV and that sort of thing, UV reflected plumages. Um, so I'll leave that there and look at variations across the retina. And I'll just show you now another rather horrific diagram, but again, I'll try and take you through it because it does actually tell you some very interesting things here. What we're looking at is, it, this is a retina of, of a, a budgerigar. Uh, it's always a budgerigar or nearly always a budgerigar that's been worked on. Um, uh, and the retina is at the back of the eye. That's where the information is, is first analyzed uh, that's coming in through the optical system. And what you find is that although I've talked about the, the rods and the cones there and that there are millions of them, they're not uniformly distributed across the retina. And they're grouped actually by ganglion cells, it's even easier to cut, to count ganglion cells. And what a lot of comparative work has been done is to look at the structure of the retina in terms of contours, contours of density of the ganglion cells. So this diagram on the right is taking the retina of the bird, flattening it out, it's actually a curve, that's why it's got these splits in it because you can't flatten it without splitting it. And all of these lines are like contour lines where you've got ganglion cell densities, similar ganglion cell densities. Now, the, the important thing to, to note about that is that you get areas within the retina where the density of the ganglion cells suddenly becomes very, very high. And you can see an area there, the central area, where there's a very, very high concentration of receptor cells. Um, and what that area represents is an area, that's the area where acuity is best. The peripheral areas, the top and the bottom around the, around the edges of the retina, have got a quite a low acuity. But when we talk about the acuity of a budgerigar, say, what we're really talking about is the acuity of just that small central area. And that's actually interesting because that's telling us that the bird is not picking up high levels of spatial information across the whole of its field of view. It's just picking it up in a central part of its field of view. And the important thing I suppose to, to note here is that that central area of high acuity is actually looking straight at you out the screen. Uh, the best area of acuity is laterally. It's, it's going out either side of the head. So whereas we have one area directly ahead of us, which is for high acuity, and that's when we want to look at something in some detail, we look forwards and we look at bringing our area of high acuity. In the case of parrots and well, practically all other birds that have been looked at, the best area of acuity reaches out laterally both sides of the head. So they have two areas of high acuity. 
But what it means is that if this parrot, this badgerigar wants to actually have a good look at you or examine anything, it will look sideways at it. It won't look forwards at it. It will bring this area of higher security into the, to look at the particular object that it's interested in. The intriguing thing about this uh, bird, the, the budgerigar, this work on the budgerigar, is that they've got a second area of high acuity in, in the eye here, uh, which is I've, I've indicated here called the lateral area. The intriguing thing about that, if you actually do the geometry of where it's looking, where it projects, that lateral area is projecting actually backwards in the bird's field of view. It's not projecting forwards. It's a backward projecting area of higher, higher acuity. It's not the highest acuity. The highest acuity is still out to the sides of the head. But there's a second area where the bird can see particularly well, pick up detail, actually backwards, looking backwards out of its field of view. Uh, so the highest acuity is sideways, and then there's enhanced acuity backwards. Well, the question is, why does it have an area of enhanced acuity looking backwards rather than forward? You would think as a flying bird, you've got to negotiate things uh, that are difficult. It might have a high acuity area looking more forwards. That doesn't seem to be the case at all. The answer probably lies in things like this. You're probably familiar with these sorts of pictures of, of budgerigars, and budgerigars are amongst the parrots, but a lot of parrots are highly sociable. They live at high densities. Uh, they fly in dense flocks and things like that. They actually have a great deal of interest in what's going on around them. And a lot of their social behavior, and especially flying in flocks and keeping an eye on each other, is going to depend upon seeing very well all around them, but particularly knowing who's around and who's behind. Now, that's one interpretation of this, but it could also be that you have this area of slightly higher acuity projecting backwards because you're looking for predators. That's the area where predators will come from. They'll come at you from behind. And so you actually get an area of enhanced security that gives you a chance to, well, a greater chance of seeing a predator coming to you. It's, it, it's probably doing both things. The bird is using it for both. But remember, if, if you're living in a dense flock like this and trying to coordinate all your movements in a dense flock, you do need to know who's coming up behind, who's there around you, uh, as much as you need to know what's going on in front. In front's really quite easy, but behind there's things going to pop out and, and maybe take you by surprise. Uh, even if you're just sitting together, you want to know who's around you uh, and, and who may be approaching you. Uh, and, and so an area of heart security looking backwards is really uh, very valuable. The interesting thing is that this area of enhanced security looking backwards, this is the first time it's been shown in any bird. Now it's done to say it doesn't occur in other birds, um, but um, you know, at least parrots have got it and we may well find it in other birds as well. But parrots are, are the first to actually show this, this particular feature of their vision. There's also very intriguing, in, and this again is only shown so far in parrots, is variation between left and right eye retinas. And I'll try and make, make this a little bit clearer, and it's actually very intriguing. This is a, a red-tailed black cockatoo, the Australasian species. Um, and this is taking the left, the same sort of diagram we got before, these contours of high receptor density and where, the higher the density, the better the acuity, the better the able to see fine detail in something. And here, this is a pair from the, the same bird, the right and the left eye of the same bird. The pattern overall, if you look at that, you, there's, the pattern's the same. It's a relatively high area of acuity in the middle part of the retina that is looking out sideways from the bird. But if you look in great in close detail, and I suspect you won't be able to see it on your screens, but the numbers in these diagrams are different. And what those numbers are showing is the absolute density of these receptors. And the important thing in, in this bird is that in the left eye, the receptors are at a much higher density than they are in the right eye. Um, so the two eyes are not getting the same view of the world. They may be looking at the same bit, but they're analyzing the world in different ways. And in the left eye, it's able to extract finer detail from, from the world. This isn't just unique to this one. It's been found in another of the black cockatoos, the Carnaby's black cockatoo. Uh, and the same thing again, similar sort of pattern. But again, it's the left eye, which has the highest density and therefore the highest acuity uh, of, 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 compared with the right eye. 
It's not true of all parrots because the same thing has been done. This is galahs and cockatiels, and the two eyes look as though they're the same. You know, the, there's no difference in acuity between the left eye and the right eye. Now, what's all this about? Well, it may well be something to do with uh, uh, preferences, uh, and there's a phenomena which probably all of you are aware of, that some birds have a real strong preference for holding things, picking up things and examining things with one particular foot. And so in this, this is a, a little Corello series of photographs uh, where it's showing left foot, left eye preference when feeding. So it actually examines something prefer preferentially with its left eye. It picks it up uh, with its left foot and then may bring it up to have a closer look at it, but primarily using the left eye, favoring the left eye. And that's uh, reflecting maybe that it's got higher acuity in its left eye. So there's this lateralization in the brain of the birds that enables or encourages them to use one eye rather than another uh, processing. And the, the retina is reflecting that in giving them perhaps a little bit more detail in the left eye compared with the right eye. Um, I mean, it, it's very intriguing that you, you actually find that uh, um, and you probably will have your own observations of whether the birds are left foot preference and, or whether they're right footed preference. No one's done it with any species where there's a right footed preference yet uh, to see whether this, uh, the, the, the pattern of uh, acuity also changes to the right eye if you've got a right foot preference, a uh, right foot, right eye preference. Now, visual fields, I'll just say something about that. Here's us, here's the human. And when you think about it, we're very peculiar, very peculiar species. If you cast around the animal kingdom, we're unusual. There aren't many species which have two eyes right in the front of the head that stare forwards. And the two eyes more or less see the same thing. Um, we, we really are strange in doing that. Most animals actually have eyes more laterally placed in the head. And some of the birds have eyes really very markedly. Uh, placed in, in the side of the head, as I showed you earlier with a duck, where they see all around them. We're very strange in having two eyes at the front, and if we want to look at something, we have to bring our head and turn and look very clearly at it. Whereas most birds and most other animals, actually, most other vertebrates, uh, will have eyes which are picking up information from all around them. This is a way of actually presenting this information, and I'm, I'm presenting it here because we're going to look at a comparison with the parrot in a minute. And, and so this is a way the top diagram, uh, the circular diagram, is as though we're projecting onto a sphere surrounding the head. You could be surrounding your head, you could be in the middle of this sphere. And we've projected out onto the surface the part of the world which you see with your binocular vision here in green. And then the blue bit is the blind area behind your head. The lower diagram is a section through the head. And you can see we've got about 120 degrees of binocular vision and a small area of uh, monocular vision and a big blind area behind. And also the diagram at the bottom shows that we've, we only see a small area above and below the, the horizontal. We've got huge areas around our head that we know nothing what's going on at any one moment. When it comes to parrots, things are very different as you might imagine. The eyes are right on the side of the head and this is the same sort of diagram. And, and what you find is that the binocular field starts somewhere around about the bottom of the bill there, and it stretches, this is the diagram here, and it stretches right up above the head. And, and in fact, binocular vision stretches from about here, right ray right round to behind the to, to some behind head, not right down to the horizontal, but somewhere up here. And, and the binocular field though, uh, is actually very narrow. It's much, much narrower than ourselves. 27 degrees at the most in, in the species of which have been looked at so far. But it means that they have a very small blind area behind the head. So parrots do have a blind area. They don't have totally comprehensive vision, but they don't have to move their head very much to be able to actually see what's going on behind them. If you've got a 16 degree blind area, blind area behind your head, you only have to move it eight degrees one way or the other and you'll cover everything that's around you. So you just small head movements is enough just to check everything that's going on around you all the time. I mean, if we want to do that sort of thing, we really do have to move our head incredibly. But the parrot, along with other birds, but the parrots particularly, can sit there and very small movements of the head are sufficient to actually get that visual coverage. And if that is combined with the idea we saw in the 
budgeries are that it's got high acuity areas also back there, very small areas, movements of the head, and it can get very good coverage of what's behind them. This is an, like the same diagram on the left of the bird, but this is a getting a, a vertical section through the head of the bird, showing it's got its binocular vision extending from down here, just below the direction of the bill, right away above the head. Uh, now, what this actually shows, and the important thing is here, here that the bird can't actually see its, its own bill tip. It can't really see what it's holding in its own bill. If it picks up something, it can't actually see it, unless it's something that ex it's a long stick that extends both sides. But where it's actually holding it, it can't actually see it. Um, these are diagrams, you know, to, to suggest this is a, on the left is a bird sitting on a flat surface, on the right sitting on the edge of something, uh, and both indicating that if the bird wants to actually see something, it's got to bend, binocularly that is, it's got to bend its head forward and have a look, but at the same time it's still carrying a lot of information from behind its head. But in both of these diagrams, I expect, sorry, the diagram on the right where the bird is holding it, holding something, it's picked up something in its foot and it's holding it, the bird can only just about see that, it can't see that in, in, in any detail. So it can't use vision to control what's in, actually in its own bill. Um, now, the, the, the one, this is where we get vision and another sense actually uh, integrate together, because one of the important things about parrot bills, especially at the very tip of them, is that they've got this thing called a bill tip organ. And this is a touch sensitive uh, structure. Uh, and these little pits here, these little marks here, running round, and they're right inside the inner edge of the little tip of the bird. So, and again, this one is opening the bill, showing these little marks here. It's these little marks, not the lines, it's the little marks around the edge. They actually are clusters of touch sensitive receptors. So the bill tip itself, is very sensitive to touch. The bird can actually feel things just right of its bill tip. And this, the, the, as you probably know, the bill tip is, is actually only keratin. There's no, no uh, skeletal structure there, but extending right down into that highly curved bill tip is this highly sensitive touch sensitive recept group of receptors. And it's called a bill tip organ. The intriguing thing is that it was first described in about 1880, something like that. Uh, and it's taken a very long time for any further work to actually be done upon it. And it's still an area where we really don't know very much. And it's some, it seems to be something that's really very important to the birds. But what this actually, the reason why I, I'm sort of, I'm interested in it from the vision is that the bird can't see its bill tip, but it can feel what's right at its bill tip. It knows what it's actually holding in its bill uh, very accurately from these clusters of touch sensitive receptors right at the base of the bill. So it can actually manipulate things very accurately using touch without having to see yet gain vision. Now, you could turn that argument on its head. You could say, well, because it's got touch, that's allowed the eyes to evolve, go up onto the head to give it comprehensive vision and see what's going on around it. It's an interaction between the two senses and we don't really know what's driving it. Um, but the two together mean that the bird can see comprehensively around it, but at the same time, can actually hold something in its bill and then manipulate it without having to see what that is at all. Uh, I mean, think of other birds, other pecking birds, they actually do see what's down there. And a lot of birds I, I've worked on, they, they, they can actually, and they do actually look to see what they're holding in their bill. They open the mouth, they peck at something, and the eyes are in such a position that they can actually see what they're manipulating. The parents can't do that, they see it from a distance and then they pick it up and then they can continue to manipulate it using touch sensitivity in the bill tip uh, and probably also in the tongue as well. So um, have a look for these. You, you should see them in your, in your birds. You should be able to see these clusters uh, of touch sensitive receptors. So basically this is vision and touch complementing each other. And that's an important thing. And you might be able to see that when you observe your own birds that they're swapping information between one sense and another. It also has an, oh, sorry, bill, bill tips, organs are not unique to parrots. Uh, these are two examples of other sorts of bill tip organs. They're not the same. They're, uh, they look as though they've evolved 
uh, quite independently, quite separately in different groups. But again, clusters of touch sensitive receptors just at the very tip of the bill. And in the case of the, 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 the long billed wading bird at the bottom there that's used for probing and detecting things that are hidden. In the case of the mallard duck, it's used for finding things uh, that's buried in, in thick mud or murky waters and things like that and be able to get them. What these enable these birds to do is to forage without seeing what they're doing. And both of these birds, both the, 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 the woodcock here and the mallard, can see comprehensively all around their head. They can see everything around them. And, and that's, as a, that's thanks to the ability to actually forage using touch sensitivity at the bill tip. But to say other birds which are pecking, going for particular objects, they have to be visually guided and their eyes are in a more forward position in the head and they have, have sizable blind areas behind the head. So the parrot is midway there. It's not quite comprehensive vision, it's near comprehensive vision. And the, the, uh, the touch sensitive receptors are really helping the bird to achieve that. The, the bill tip organ, is really probably the explanation for what's often referred to as the third limb. Bird, a lot of parrots use their bills for climbing, for cloak, for holding on to things. Uh, you know, right, swinging on ropes, swinging on ladders, and things like using their bill, climbing up and down, um, it, using three points of stability: the bill and two feet. And the, obviously, if you're going to use your bill for, as a point of stability for sorting yourself out. Uh, when you're climbing, you do need to have some feedback and that's where the bill tip organ will also come in. So it's not necessarily just to do with manipulating food, it's manipulating other sorts of objects, exploring them with the bill tip using touch sensitive uh, receptors. You also see exploratory behaviour. I've got this nice picture of a kakapo here, which apparently seems to be using its bill perhaps for exploring things. Remember kakapo is a nocturnal or at least a semi-nocturnal bird who creeps around, it's flightless, creeps around eating a wide variety of things, but basically a vegetable diet. Um, but it does explore and pull things apart and the bill tip organ will be doing that. But also intimate behaviors, you know, allopreneum and things like that. Uh, very, very fine judgments, adjustments can be made of position. And that's gonna be done primarily under touch control at the bill tip organ not under visual control. The birds are feeling it, feeling what's there rather than actually seeing it. Um, right, okay, finally, speed of vision. And this was a, a question that was posed to me. I was, I was quite surprised uh, that I got asked this, but I got, I've been asked this a number of times now. Amy asked me particularly about this, but other people have, have done as well. Uh, and the speed of vision. And basically the question is, do parrots see the flicker of a fluorescent tubes, for example? There was a lot of interest a few years ago uh, about flicker being a problem, seeing flicker being a problem for keeping chickens in, in enclosures where there was fluorescent lights and whether the birds actually could see the fluorescent lights flickering and that this might be disturbing to the birds. And so it became a welfare issue that the birds would actually see something flickering, which we didn't see flickering uh, because they had a higher speed of vision or basically they could see flicker. And it's measured using a thing called the flicker fusion frequency. Um, and it's the frequency of a, the flicker fusion frequency is the frequency of a flashing light at which the eye can no longer distinguish a flickering light from a constant light. And you, you in, investigate this using the same sorts of techniques that I've showed at the very beginning for looking at spatial resolution and acuity. You could give the bird a choice between a steady light and a flickering light, and then you start to play around. Once it's learned to make, make its choice and say where the flickering light is, you start to play around with the frequency of the flickering, and you find uh, what's the highest frequency at which something is flickering that it can still detect. The thing that got people quite excited is that you get very high flicker fusion rates in some of the small passerine birds. And of course, you know that parrots and passerines are regarded as sister taxa now. They're really, really quite closely related. And they share, say, the, the presence of the uh, ultraviolet sensitive cone. Uh, that's a, you know, a, a, a feature which all passerines share with all parrots. And so, uh, amongst some of these passerines, a very, very high flicker, flicker frequency, Hertz's uh, cycles per second, 
And so this is saying that things like blue tits and fly, there's a fly catcher, um, can, can see very high flickering, flickering lights, much higher flickering rates than we can actually detect. Well, fortunately, somebody has done, done the right experiments now um, with, um, uh, oh yes, and the interpretation is that small birds need to have this very high flicker free, you know, its function is to do with rapidly moving in complex environments. So again, we might predict that a parrot equally if it's a, you know, it's a forest parrot or something like that, is going to face the same sorts of things as, as the small uh, passerine, you know, shown here, the, 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 the flycatcher or something like that. The temporal, um, the other thing about flicker is that it's also a function of light level in the same way as acuity is. Uh, but when we actually look, um, someone's actually done the experiments now, long-term training experiments with budgerigars to find to look at flicker fusion. Uh, and the average flicker fusion frequency of, of, of a budgerigar is about 82 hertz. So it's considerably half that of the small passerines, so 130 to 140. So it's not uh, one of the interpretations of the work with the parrots was that it's not just being a small bird that flies in complicated habitats that lead to very high flicker fusion. There's something else going on as well because the parrots, or these budgerigars at least, have got a much lower flicker fusion than, than small passerines. Um, basically, the uh, budgerigars and possibly other parrots are unable to detect the flicker of artificial lights. They basically don't see any more flicker than we do. We see flicker up to a certain rate and the, and the parrots, or the budgerigar at least, sees flicker up to more or less the same rate as what we do. So if we see it as flickering, the parrot will see it as flickering. If we see it as steady, the parrot will see it as steady. So it, it doesn't seem to be a problem with worrying about at least fluorescent tubes and lamps and that sort of thing. They're not going to see flickering. And it suggests also that video, that's such like if it's, if it's based upon using uh, flickering, then they're, they're going to see it as steady. They're not going to see it as flickering either. I put at the bottom of this one the the, the reference to the paper, only published three years ago, as you can see, um, on the flicker fusion. In case any of you, you know, really want to pursue this, because I know this is something that uh, some people have got really quite interested in and, and really want to know about. Um, so basically, the, the, the answer is that parrots don't see flickering things anywhere near at the the way uh, as easily as small passerines. And I suspect there may be a question over whether really the small passerines really do see that very uh, fine flicker that, that they've been claimed to be able to see. Uh, but basically, the parrots and you are going to have similar flicker fusion frequency. Right, OK, just by way of a quick summary, I'll just run through what we've covered. Um, we've looked at spatial resolution. Parrots, well, the parrots we've looked at are sort of in the middle range of other birds. They've not got fantastic high acuity. They've not, not particularly low acuity, uh, but they're not as good as we are. We can see finer detail than they can. Um, the visible spectrum is a very different thing when it comes to and color vision. They're probably better color vision than we've got, and they certainly can see a wider part of the visible spectrum, and they can certainly see into the ultraviolet. And that does seem to be used importantly for signaling differences, uh, maybe between sexes in certain species and things like that. It's something that's actually used by the birds. It's not just something that they can do. It's been uh, used, exploited through evolution uh, to actually become a functional thing. That they actually will see plumage patterns, which we cannot, and that's important. Um, Variations across the retina, well, we saw that there are at least some parrots that have better resolution. They can see more detail with their left eye than their right eye. And that actually can be tied up with perhaps left eye preferences and maybe differences even within the lateralization within the brain and things like that. So that's a very interesting thing. Uh, and, and maybe you'll be able to see just how, you know, whether, whether your birds are really using their left eye or their right eye preferentially, uh, and the, the chances are that they may be reflecting the fact that they can see more detail with one eye rather than the other. Um, the visual fields we saw are, are really very different to ours. You know, I don't think that anybody would think that they look the same as ours, but they really are very different, and they can see much more of the world than we can. 
and they only need to move their head by a small amount to be able to get complete coverage and know exactly what's behind them, who's, who's approaching them and that sort of thing. Whereas for ourselves, the world is always out in front. I always like to think that we, we sort of experience the world always out in front and we always sort of sort of move forwards into the world. We think, you know, the world's always out there and we're moving forwards into it. And as soon as we move forward, we've forgotten what was behind us more or less. But a lot of birds, and especially it will be applied to the parrots, they see, they actually flow through the world. They see something ahead of them, they move towards it, it flows past in their lateral vision and it disappears behind them. So they actually flow through the world keeping track on things as they as they go past them and behind them. They don't just suddenly cut off and disappear. They're actually flowing through the world. Vision and touch, very important. But the idea that they're using a bill tip organ to help them manipulate things and maybe uh, also to guide them when they're using their bill for climbing and that sort of thing. Uh, and the bill tip organ, I think, is very important to, 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 to parrots. Uh, it's a shame there isn't more known about, about it. Uh, but I suspect it, it, we will get some more information, but uh, people just haven't, for some reason, haven't really looked at it. They've looked at bill tip organs in other groups of birds like the ducks and the long billed waders, but they haven't actually picked up on doing it much in parrots yet. And then finally, just recapping uh, the speed of vision flicker fusion. Uh, it looks as though they don't have anywhere near the flicker fusion rate that small passerines do and they probably have got a very similar flicker fusion rate to what we have, which means that if we see it flickering, so will they, but they won't see anything flickering that, that we cannot actually appreciate that's flickering as well. So they, they live in, in a similar world. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, yes, just a mention of my book, but I was very pleased to see my book was mentioned at the beginning. Uh, but, if, if you, but the point about the book is that if you're really interested uh, in, in, in your parrots and you want to see them in a broader context of what other birds can do, which I've tried to help you with, the book here is, is trying to take a survey across all bird species and trying to see what the diversity really is, the possibilities are, so you can see just where your parrots actually fit in to, to all of that. Okay, oh no, that's, sorry, that's <laughs> all of them. Okay, that's it, I'll leave it there, thank you. Uh, fabulous, uh, absolutely fabulous talk. I, I hope everyone uh, found this as fascinating as I did. Oh, uh, do you want to turn off screen sharing, Graham? Uh, how do I do that? Um, um, you should see a stop screen sharing button there. Stop, uh, stop share, yes. That's it. Oh, okay, good. Okay. Then good. We, we, can have, uh, we can have people ask questions. So um, uh, oh, we had a question in the chat. I don't want to forget that. Sometimes birds' bills need to be trimmed. And of course, birds' bills gradually sort of wear off on their own, but occasionally they need trimming. So if you trim a bird's beak, you're actually removing some of those sensory organs then, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it depends where what you're trimming. I mean, remember that they're running around the edge uh, towards the tip. I mean, if you get a situation I don't know whether you get it much in parrots, but I've seen it, you know, in other birds where the, the tips overgrow and things like that, and you just take off the end to bring it back to what it is. It's quite likely then that you're not interfering with the with the bill tip organ. But if you cut too much back, then you are likely to to cut into where the bill tip organ is. Uh, so there there is there is a question. I, that's why I'm surprised that it hasn't actually been looked at <laughs> in detail by, by other, other researchers, but it seems to be well authenticated that it, it's there and, you know, such like. So it is, it is a, a sort of a place of concern. That, you know, people should be aware of it. Yeah, and of course, some birds lose a part of their bill to, to injury. Yeah. So, yeah. But, but at least it's not one organ, it's actually spread out. So I guess yes. you probably lose some of it and you'd still have some sensitivity yes. left. Yes, now, each, each of those pits I showed is a cluster of, of touch sensitive organs, and they're, they're probably each capable of giving quite a lot of information, but they're around the edge. So if you lost a few, you know, yes, you would get something. Yeah, you'd be, be impaired, okay. but you'd still get something. Yeah. You know, it's interesting with the two level, the two centers of acuity. I'd heard that before. I, I think there, there are some other birds that have that as well. Uh, but it's interesting, I've noticed with my birds, a lot of times when they look at something intently, they'll shift the eye forward, back, forward, back, forward, back rapidly. 
And I'm wondering if that's so that they can take advantage of both centers of visual acuity to, to fully try to understand what it is they're looking at. Yeah, it, it could be. It could also be that there might be differences which don't show up when you do these sort of ganglion cell counts. It could be that there are different areas where color vision is slightly better as well, able to discriminate finer colors in, in one area than another. That is, that is a bit speculative, but, uh, but it's very difficult to get hold of that. The thing that people measure are these, you know, the receptor, the ganglion cell thing, because it's an easy thing to measure and that gives you a direct idea about resolution. But there are other very marked differences in the abundance of different types of, uh, of cone cells in the retina. It's been, it's been well studied in the pigeon, believe it or not, partly because that's a basic bird. Uh, and some very fascinating patterns have been shown, suggesting that they've got different color vision in, in looking downwards as opposed to looking upwards. Uh, I mean, that's just in your common pigeon. So who, who knows what might be in other, other species? So it, it's spe specialized bits of the retina. Maybe what you're observing is specialized bits of the retina that give that little bit more information are being brought into play by the bird to examine something, yeah. I'm assuming when they, they do these measurements, they're doing them uh, at necropsy, right? Or can they do them non, this non-invasively or? No, no, you can only do those sorts of things in, invasively. No. Usually you're looking for, for very fresh eyes. A bird has died, you get the eye and you, 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 you look at it very quickly, yeah. Uh, so Dr. Pepperberg said that her grays had a tough time with CRT screens, but not with LCDs. Could their flicker fusion rate differ from budgies? Uh, that, that's something that you and I have also talked about also, the difference between yeah. the CRTs and the LCD screens. Yeah, I mean, the, I don't know. The, the, only, say, the only definitive stuff on flicker fusion is that paper which I, I showed, which came out three years ago. It, it's, it, it's the best we can get, I suppose of understanding about flicker, um, but there may be other aspects that are going on, can't actually be sure. But on the sort of simple basis, they don't have the flicker fusion, high, very, very high flicker fusion rate that a lot of birds, or, or the small passerines have. Uh, that's all we can say. But, but I mean, it's, it's something that's just not, not researched in great detail, but on the face of it, they're not much different to ourselves. So if, if we don't see it flickering, and the bird won't see it flickering. That seems to be the message. And that was the message in that paper. That's what, in the paper, the authors actually concluded they made that, that strong statement that that was the case. Uh, right. So it needs, it needs somebody else to look at it in detail, really, yeah. Uh, so Gail asks, since birds have so much more within their view, have there been adaptations to their brains to process so much information, or does a reduced focus make up the difference? Ooh, well, <laughs> that's, I mean, that's actually very fundamental, really, because, yes, I mean, it, it, it sort of, it's a bit trying or testing for us to try and comprehend what it means to be able to see everything around you all the time, which is what some birds certainly can do, and parrots can more or less see what's all above their head and around them all the time. What that means in terms of neural anatomy, how that's actually dealt with, hasn't actually been, been properly worked out. Um, and it, it's, it, it's obviously a challenge for people to actually understand that, yeah. Um, so we, we really don't know enough uh, about the, the, you know, the, the brain structures that are able, that are underlying that ability to see all around them uh, in any bird species, surprisingly. Right, uh, but, right. So uh, Donna says, could the flicker fusion rate be a function of flying flocks? And this, of course, brings up, a, you know, the, the, the species that, seem to be studied in a lot of these uh, studies are Australian or Australasian species. Yeah, yeah. And budgies fly in these huge flocks, but then you look at say South American birds, macaws for example, that don't tend to fly in big flocks. So yeah. uh, it makes you wonder if these things might be different between them. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they are. I mean, you know, I, I was asked to talk about parrots, um, you know, and, and, you know, a while ago and, and, and I've tried to bring together all that's known, you know, in, in reasonably published work, um, but it only ever deals with the two or three species. And so we're just generalizing terribly. And, there, you know, there's fantastic questions to ask. I mean, my, my own research, which has looked at, I published papers on about 60 species of birds 
particularly aspects of their vision, and they're all different. Um, uh, and you can you can get differences in vision, especially visual fields and things like that, between quite closely related species. So you've got to be very careful that you don't think that all I've told you applies to every parrot. You know, right. people people really do need to to look because we we would expect diversity because it looks as though vision is as flexible in response to sort of ecological demands and things like that as, as other structures that the birds have. So it just needs more people to do more research <laughs> on, on, on and, and choosing some more in like you've just said, you know, choosing some more interesting species that are likely to be have comparison, you know, become sure things will pop out. There'll be some very interesting things. I'm sure vision is, is very important to analyze. I, I saw you You've done some work with the um, the windmills, yeah. So that that's really important to know how, how that affects bird vision, how well they see that in terms of how well they can avoid yeah. hitting yeah. the blades. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And we really don't know. I mean, it, it becomes there's a sensory side of it. You know, do they see? Do they actually see the blades moving and that sort of thing? But then there becomes a sort of a, a cognitive side of it. Which is, you know, what what are they? What sense do they make of that? What do they interpret it as? In other words, you know, I mean, so how they interpret it will determine their response to it. Uh, and we've we've just done some work recently. I've been involved with with people who are looking at birds getting caught in in gill nets because that's a huge problem. Fishing nets, gill nets, uh, and they're trying to find ways of deterring birds from from gill nets. Uh, and Suddenly, you know, one species does this when you use this particular deterrent, flashing lights or something, and another species does something different. Some are rejected, some are attracted. So it does need a lot of work to actually do this, but we, but we well, we've got to start somewhere, you know, and, 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 and get into that. Yeah. Has your lab also worked on um, the science behind deterring birds from flying into glass? No, I, I've not looked at that, but I, I know people who have worked on that. And there's a there's a there's a big thing about birds flying into glass. There's a lot of work being done. Uh, there don't seem to be any simple solutions, unfortunately. Um, I mean, there are solutions that reduce it, but they're not going to stop them flying into glass. But it is a, it is a huge problem. Uh, one thing that did come out of it is that just putting a few uh, sort of silhouette cutouts on your your pane of glass doesn't really stop. If you really want to stop birds flying into glass, you've got to put a lot of uh, sort of parallel lines and things over it. You've really got to obscure the, the reflective effect of glass to actually make it work. That's what seems to be the, or you, you, you put the glass in such a position that it doesn't act like a mirror. That's often the problem is that glass acts like a mirror and the bird sees ahead of it the world that's actually behind it and it tries to fly into what is actually behind itself because it sees the mirror image of it. So the only thing you can do is to get rid of the, the mirror in some way. Right. And that's not, a, that's not a very easy solution because people like big windows and like right. looking out of them, you know. Uh, does, uh, if anybody wants to ask questions, you can post in the chat or you can unmute yourself. So do we have some other questions? Can I use my video? Of course. Oh, hello? Oh, hey. Hi, Dr. Martin. This is a wonderful talk. It's so exciting to, to hear and uh, learn all about the bird vision. I was wondering if you could talk a little more about, this is something I've been curious about for a while, is the function of the double cones? That were right, in the diagram. Yeah. okay, yeah. Well, I, di I didn't mention double cones. They were in the diagram, if you were quick you would have seen them that I showed. The double cones seem to be not anything to do with color vision. I mean, this isn't my work, this is other people. They don't seem to be anything to do with color vision. They seem to be a mechanism that's to do with measuring luminance, brightness. And they're a completely separate channel. So in fact, when you uh, when you look at a, a bird retina, or, you know, a passerine retina or, or a parrot retina, you've actually got five types of cones. You've got the four single cones and you've got the double cones. And then you've got also the rods. So you've actually got six types of receptors. Um, you know, so we, we, we now think that the single cones are the things that give you color vision. So it's a what's called a tetrachromatic color vision system as opposed to ours, which is trichromatic. Uh, 
uh, but the double cones seem to be something which is a separate channel that is just to do with measuring luminance or brightness. Uh, it's, it's working quite you know, separately. Um, I'll, I mean, there are references, there's, there's stuff I could, could dig out for you to, to tell you that, 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 but there have been people do. I mean, at one time they did think that the double cones were part of the color vision system. And, and it made the color vision even more elaborate and complicated. It now seems that you can park them on one side. They're not part of the color. They're doing something else. Uh, double cones are not unique to birds. I mean, you get double cones in a lot of other, other groups. Um, that you don't tend to find them, in, obviously humans don't have them, so we've tended to ignore them, but they do actually seem to be quite important. Um, so, you know, if you want to write to me, I'll, I'll send you some references to, to the luminance and double cones. Um, so, but I think, I think the consensus is they're not part of color vision. So is that sort of in the same way that we're colorblind with respect to birds as it comes to UV, they, they can experience luminance in some way that we yeah. just like don't yeah. understand? Yeah, I don't know. We don't know, but that's what it seems to be. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I was just thinking about the built up organ again. When our parents take something in their mouth, I'm, we've all experienced that they rotate it. They're always turning and turning and turning, turning the thing, whether it be food or a toy. And I always had assumed that it was that they were using their tongue to just uh, go over the surface to determine the shape or how it yeah. felt and all that. But now I, I'm thinking maybe it's it's they're turning it so that all the different little pockets of, of the sense organs can detect it to get the maximum amount of information well, about the object. Yeah, they, they, I mean, they also have, I mean, they also have touch sensitive receptors on their tongues. I mean, all birds have touch sensitive receptors on their tongues, in fact. They tend to be more towards the back, not at the front of the tongue, but they do have touch sensitive receptors. But then, then there are these certain groups of birds which have high, highly developed touch sensitive receptors in their bills. So mo most birds will be using their bill, their bill, their tongue to actually control something before they swallow it, for example. It's in the mouth. They've got to get it ready to actually swallow it. So the tongue will be coming in there to do that. So the tongue in parrots is probably also doing the same thing. And we don't know where the touch sensitive receptors are over a parrot's tongue. Uh, I mean, their tongues are so different compared with, say, a passerine. Um, you, you might, you know, you might find groups of touchy sensitive receptors all over the tongue rather than at the back of it. But you're right, the, 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 the tongue could also be pushing the thing around so that it can be sampled, as it were, by the, 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 the built-up organ touch sensitive receptors as well. There's something very complicated going on there. I mean, uh, and touch is very important. And there'll be tastes coming in as well. The, the tongue will have some taste receptors as well. Uh, so you, they may be tasting it, you know, they're, 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 they're trying to get as much information from it as they can, because they're trying to decide whether it might be edible, or it might be useful to them sort of thing, you know, uh, and so you want to use touch as well as taste and you'll have obviously visually inspected it before, before you actually picked it up and that sort of thing. So the, the bird's giving the whole the thing, of, you know, trying to get a lot of information out of that. Are there other birds that use their uh, beaks as much as parrots do? You know, for all that information, all, the, all that manipulation of things. Yeah. Ooh, I don't know quite comprehensively, um, but they certainly. I mean, parrots are always noted for being, you know, for really being able to manipulate objects, and they manipulate objects throughout, and they explore new objects throughout the whole of their lives, and this sort of thing using their bills. Um, most, I mean, I'm thinking about most of the birds that I look at, or have looked at. You know, their bill is just purely for grabbing things you know it's actually used as something for seizing something if you're going to eat it or maybe seizing some nest material but it's just grabbing it and positioning it roughly uh ready for swallowing say or if you're going to try and uh you know using it for nest building you place it sort of approximately and then manipulate it uh, i don't think you use the bill real other birds use their bill very much for manipulating and exploring it's used for well, for searching, for grabbing things, you know, and that's about it. 
that I, 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 you know, I haven't really given enough thought. It's ten and a half thousand species of, oh no, probably eleven thousand species of birds now. <laughs> so there, there, there'll be some, some others somewhere, I'm sure. But parrots certainly are well known, for, obviously, for for that manipulative skill. Yeah. Wow. And, and what about taste? As as long as we're in the beak area, do do they have? Um the same numbers and kinds and differences of taste buds that we do? Well, yes. I mean, you need to read my book. There's, I've got, <laughs> I have got something in there about taste. Right but, here. But, but, but taste, is, taste is not very well researched uh, in birds. Uh, most of the work on birds is, is based upon chickens and ducks uh, because people have been interested in taste because of raising them domestically and making sure they're efficient food machines to turn, you know, turn food into protein, basically. So they've been trying to maximize foods for, you know, for the birds to ingest. Um, but it looks as though the same sorts of taste receptors are found across a very wide range of species. Um, but no one's really looked. I mean, I, I can say all oh, those have taste receptors in parrots, but I would wouldn't be surprised if it's only ever been looked at in one or two species but that's going to apply to so many things you know that um but they certainly taste receptors are there but the numbers of them and what groups uh, of, of uh, chemicals they can actually um you, you know select and detect um is probably really quite limited but we don't know enough about it and as you always hear that parrots don't have much taste which i I, I find it really hard to believe it's true because they have such distinct food preferences and um, they always seem to like some things, not like other things. And uh, you would think they wouldn't really care if they couldn't taste much. And they also tell us that parrots don't really smell, but you know, again, I don't know if there's really been much of any research on that. No, no, there probably hasn't. There, the, I mean, the smell again. You know, there's there's something in the book about it. Um, I've tried to to pull out what's what's known about smell, uh, and there, there, in terms of parrots, the only species in species of parrot in which there is sort of sort of experimental or, or semi-experimental evidence uh, of, of use of smell uh, is is in uh, kakapos, uh, where they did some simple experiments, but also there, there is other, the other evidence is that parrots themselves have, have odours. And there's, a, there's growing evidence now that a lot of birds maybe have a sense of smell, which is highly developed, which people used to dismiss. Um, and it, it is used for communication between the individuals. Um, that, you know, that again, that's, you know, you can't say that about lots and lots of species we only know that for a few species but there is evidence that the sense of smell is used by a lot of birds in in ways that we you know only just beginning to understand and that people have said oh you know smell isn't important to birds but it does seem to be to be actually quite important to a lot of birds i'll, I'll just give you one example i mean i shouldn't go on too much about smell but um there's been some quite interesting work recently on small um great tits chickadees i think you call them you know the, those sorts of birds showing that they use a sense of smell probably to detect when there's a lot of caterpillars in a woodland because they actually detect uh, the smell that's given out by the leaves when the, when caterpillars attack the leaves the the leaves give out a smell um which you know uh, and it looks as though the birds can actually detect so the experiments done to show that the birds would go preferentially or could go towards um, a, a tree which had been infested with caterpillars uh, and, and one which hadn't um, based on the sense of smell. They couldn't see, but they could probably smell the difference. Um, now that's a tantalizing experiment, um, but it does actually suggest clearly that the sense of smell is very important to a lot of a lot of birds and maybe very important to I mean you know to a lots of birds so you shouldn't dismiss it at all in parrots I think you know we should really that's, keep that open. It's actually pretty amazing to be able to smell smell caterpillars. Well yeah, tree. yeah. I mean, that's exactly what they're smelling the compound isn't known but they seem to right. show a wow. behavior which suggests that they the only thing they can be using is the sense of smell to to decide to forage in that part and it makes very good sense because you know 
trees covered in caterpillars are sort of scattered a bit through the woodland. And if you can find them by a sense of smell, you get a plume of smell, you fly up upstream towards it, you know, that sort of thing. Think things are the, the point about that that is that we don't know for definite, but things like that are now becoming reasonable questions to ask because it's been shown in one species. So let's have a look in others. There may be some even more interesting things going on, and that would certainly apply in, in, in parrots where you get certain some parrots give out particular odors and things like that, it seems, and that may well be used for social communication. Wonderful. Do we have any more questions? Uh, Amy, I've got a question on, I guess, the sturdiness of the eyeballs. Um, you know, I think of humans, and if we're going somewhere fast, like a motorcycle, we'll put goggles on to protect our eyes. And it seems nowadays, by the time everybody's 30, they need some kind of glasses to correct their vision. Yeah. Uh, what happens with birds? I mean, I'm sure we don't see a lot of blind birds flying around. Um, but do they have the danger of, of as they're flying, bugs getting in their eyes and harming them? Well, they've got, uh, <laughs> they've got eyelids, they can blink, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but they also have a third, I think a third eye, well, it's referred to as a third eyelid mm -hmm. called the nictitating membrane, which sweeps very, very close across the cornea. And one of the functions of that seems to be to keep the cornea moist and clear when they're flying. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's an extra, there is an extra thing there if you're flying and you're, you may be drying out your cornea if you're moving quite rapidly. Yeah. And you know, a quick flick of the, the nictitating membrane, which does actually secrete the fluid behind it as well, uh, that might keep the whole thing moist. But obviously, if you fly into an obstacle, then your eye is just as vulnerable as any, any other yeah. animal if you actually crash into things. Um, I, I think parrots are very interesting in that they because some of them are very long lived, they may accumulate problems in the, in their eyes. I mean, most most birds because don't live very long, so some of the problems that you get vision that we we suffer with are a result of age and sort of deterioration with age, changing with age. Mm -hmm. um, but we but you know but if we live long, then we get. I, I've got an older ring neck that had yeah. a, um, a yeah. cancer on the third eyelid. Yeah so, yeah, so those sorts of things come about through aging or, or as a result of age. Um, cataracts as well. I don't know whether parrots get cataracts, but some, some longer lived birds certainly get cataracts. Whereas most, you know, most small passerines don't live long enough for things like that to actually develop. Um, but of course, if you're in the wild and you start to get, develop cataracts, you start to lose spatial resolution, you're not going to survive long. Mm. But of course, if you're keeping them in captivity and looking after them very well, then they're likely to show some of these pathologies um, simply because, you you know, they, they can be kept alive with mm. the impaired vision, that sort of thing. So in, in the wild, they wouldn't last long, but mm -hmm. they, they certainly will get these problems. They, they certainly do. Um, and, you know, uh, certainly cataracts in, in owls, for example, can get cataracts or are known to get cataracts. Mm. And they're another group of can be long lived birds as well. Yeah, uh, Paula, who's a um, uh, wildlife rehabber, particularly hummingbird, said she took in a female hummingbird with a damaged cornea, didn't know what caused it, but she didn't recover. Yeah, yeah parrots do get cataracts. We actually, um, we had a veterinary talk recently, and it was one of the uh, geriatric issues addre addressed. Um, and yes, I know e an eagle was actually, a bald eagle was actually the first cataract surgery successfully done on a bird in the US. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. And I think they have done some parrot ones. Obviously the smaller the eye, the, the more difficult it is to do a surgery. And the yeah. eagles have larger eyes. So yeah. Um, yeah. it was probably, com it was comparable to doing a human cataract surgery. Yeah, so the eye size will probably be quite comparable to our own or not much more than our own so maybe they can you know use more or less the same techniques yeah right right as da says if you watch a video of a peregrine falcon you can see the nictitating membrane close in a fast dive uh yeah i mean that that's sort of their screen but you know if they were to actually crash into an object as dr martin said they could still damage their eye yeah of course, their fields, they've got such strong fields of the vision, maybe that also protects them from 
smashing into things with your yeah. eyeballs. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any other questions or questions or comments? Yeah, an antsy cocktail here. <laughs> All right. Well, if not, I want to thank you again, Dr. Graham, very much. This was a fabulous talk. I, I find vision one of the most uh, fascinating of the senses and combine that with birds is such incredibly interesting information. And I highly recommend, again, here's the book. Bird senses. <laughs> oh, done. <laughs> sort of turn it in. I'm, yeah. I'm always backwards on Zoom, so I can never figure out how to turn something. But anyhow, this is available uh, on Amazon. It looks like a great book. Um, so you can learn everything more about senses. And uh, again, thank you so much for the talk. It was, it was so interesting. The chat's filled with a lot of thank yous there, too, if, if you look okay. over oh, there. Great. Good. And um, oh, it looks like someone else has the book ready, too, as well. So. <laughs> yes. I, I did send it out with the initial notice, so I'm hoping a lot of people get that. But again, thank thanks everyone for coming. I'm gonna actually turn off the recording.